Aman sih. What do you mean, sir? Aman sih with this kind of <laughs> intro music. You know, we, it's gonna be serious tonight. <laughs> <laughs> really, good gotta be morning. serious. You know, yeah, yeah. Good morning, <laughs> good evening, good night in whichever part of the world you're tuning in from. All right. Um, yes, yes, we know already and waiting. We had a little technical difficulties that has happened, especially when we have more people coming on than usual. And mm-hmm. people who haven't been on the show before, because one of our guests is new to the show, um, one has been here already. So I want to welcome you all to the special edition of the Heights Room. You would have seen an ad floating around saying, public safety or personal choice. And we are talking here about the vaccination drive in Trinidad and Tobago. We are talking about the vaccine internationally and everything to do with this topic tonight that we could touch on in the short time that we have here, right? I mean, we could go on and on, but at the same time, we need some quality during this little time we have here tonight. I mean, we don't waste some time already, so we get straight into it. I'll check this segment, all right? So, as usual, mm-hmm. I have my co host Shankara, Antorian, Micronesia, mm-hmm. Canada in the house, and your boy from Gasparillo right mm-hmm. here. All right, the end, the Near NWO, no. the NWO, <laughs> right? The NWO trying to censor we. All right, so first yeah. of all, we just want to start off with a little pertinent news that will take us into this um, topic of the vaccination drive. And what we're looking at here is by hook or by crook, mm-hmm. school starts October 1st for those who are vaccinated. This is what was said by our Prime Minister, Keith Rowley. So this sept- this uh, Monday coming here, September 6th, we will have the resumption of classes, right? You mm-hmm. will have the online school scenario taking precedent as it has done for over a term, well, sorry, over an academic year now. And mm-hmm. now what he's saying is that if there's no significant change from that epidemi- epidemiology, we will <coughs> offer face-to-face classes to our children in Form 4, Form 5, and Form 6 in our, all our secondary schools. So we'll get exam children. So we exam children, Form 4, Form 5, and Form 6. But that option is going to be offered to vaccinated children only. So there was never any um, intention or talk of starting school for the entire school population. However, there is talk of starting school for the exam students from 4, 5, and 6. But only those who are vaccinated. And this is something hmm. that is causing an alarm. If you understand what hmm. I'm saying. Well, right? It is it's causing an alarm. So, Torian, wh- yeah. where you are now in Canada, right? Was yes, there any sir. closure of schools? Like, we have had closure of schools in Trinidad and Tobago for the past academic year. There has been no school. And even before that, there was closure of schools with no... Um, so let me correct myself. There has been online school for an academic year. And there has been no school physically since March of 2020. Right? So we're looking hmm. at over a year of no school. Almost two years of no physical school with a year of um, online school. Okay. What's the situation in Canada with schools? What was so the, the, the thing? It was school closed at first, obviously. Um, because nobody knew what's going on. And but it was just pressure all around for everybody. School closed, work from home, parents was going crazy. Um, then they opened up hybrid. So you had some could have go to school, some could have stay home. So that was the, the, the modus operandi for a little while. And then they kind of closed again when the numbers went back up and come back. And now it closed for holidays and they're looking to open back come September as in regular school. Not regular school as in back to hybrid model. Well, so what? Is, so when you say the hybrid model, there, there, how do you have any idea how that working in terms of like, so across Canada right now, you would say there are children who access an online schooling as well as, or is it from so school let me, to school? Let me, let me, let me clarify. Yeah. I will talk only mm-hmm. for Ontario, as the province I in. Yeah. Hybrid model cool. In cool. Ontario. Ontario. So it is. You had the option. Parents had the option. Um, and if you had the resources, if you had the laptop, you could stay home and do your online courses. That is, once you sign up for your online though. You stick for online. Once you sign up to come to school, you stick to your school. You can't be crossing and whatever, whatever. So Israel back and now, teachers ain't like it. Students ain't like it. Um, I know folks in the school system up here saying that 
they are students who fall into the cracks in the system. Um, I, I always give mm. an example of a, a young lady who, what we term as, she's an immigrant. English is a second language. Mm. She basically was mm. just like missing out. She was sign up for online, or I can somehow get cross where mm. she was supposed to be in school, but she stay online, and she end up missing like three quarters she semester and couldn't graduate. And unfortunately, she will have to redo the semester. So that is just one case in one school. Uh, so it, it is, hasn't been ideal for a lot of people involved um, up here with that schooling. So it's been tough all around. Tough. Yeah, hmm. we are definitely. And well, let's see in, in Micronesia, there's there's no big COVID threat to stop school or anything like that. That has never happened where you are right now. Yeah, no, no, no cases. But the system itself has become much more restricted because they they began uh, repatriation flights and they're about to have the first open flight that coming in on September 30th. So Very the problem with that is that uh, they're getting a lot stricter with like vaccinations and things. So um, they actually sent out a presidential decree last week mandating the entire population to be vaccinated, which was wow. which hit a lot of people like thing and all national government workers actually not being allowed to collect pay without presenting um, that vaccination Ooh. card. So, so dread out there. Men, a dread. Yeah, and, and, Different. and apparently last week, uh, one of the guys, one of the guys um, in the, just just an average citizen, end up going on the president's Facebook page and telling me no way he's living and all kind of thing. And Ooh. police coming and hold him for assassination attempt and all kind of thing. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Right now you need to... You can't, tell, <laughs> you can't tell Kitos that here either. You can't say that here either. You're getting, yeah. you're getting hold. You're getting hold. Now, you see, this topic yeah. of vaccination, I would say it is one of the most polarizing topics that have emerged out of the pandemic, right? And in our recent history, it is one of the most polarizing things, I would say, to come up. And it's very acute. It's happening right now. It's unfolding in front of our faces. We are seeing the trends. We are hearing the different narratives about it. And it, it has to, now it has moved towards the children. You know, now it's a different discussion. Well, a new arm of the discussion with mandatory vaccination for children. But even pulling away from children, we have the whole uh, narrative of, you know, uh, vaccinate to operate, which is the mantra being used. I, I believe mm. our prime minister echoed it and so on. We have businesses who are telling people that if they are not vaccinated, they are going to have to um, take PCR tests on a very regular basis. PCR tests are not inexpensive. They are very expensive. Um, then there are those who are telling them they might get certain bonuses. They might not even be up for renewal of contracts and so on if they are not vaccinated. And yet there, there's a lot of vaccine hesitancy in our population, and for good reason. And we all know the reasons why there are people who are, you know, champion in the vaccine and we all know why there are reasons that people are against the vaccine and its rollout especially the recent development of children so to bring some light to this uh topic and to this discussion we saw it fit to bring two doctors onto the show tonight who they don't um on, they are not on polar opposite sides or anything you know people like to think about this as a pro-vax and anti-vax discussion but it's not really that it's that we have a certain amount of information that different people are looking at in different ways and there's a certain amount of um difference in political uh le 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 legislation public health ordinance um narrative and so on like the the they are trying to get people to to, to go along with it through different methods whether it be coercion some people say some people say they are threatening people to take it and so on. We have to look at why. Is it right? Is it is it wrong? Is there right? Is there wrong? It's very complicated. It's a very, very complicated thing. So tonight, we have two doctors who share different viewpoints, but they are both cut from the same cloth of the medical field. So first up, we have Dr. Joel Rampasad. Dr. Joel Rampasad belongs to the ENT department of the San Fernando General Hospital. He has previously worked in the UK for 14 years at various hospitals. An avid environmentalist, Joel, has been involved in scouts since childhood. And he also currently runs the Duke of Edinburgh Award Center at Presentation College. So we have our prayers man in the scene tonight. And we must pull from nice, uh, the old, mm -hmm. yeah, we must pull from you the old cloth as well. <laughs> Watch me all tell us all you want mm -hmm. Joel. You know, in an upspan chat here, so tread lightly too. You never know what happened, right? Mm -hmm. uh, 
And then, of course, from, cut, cut from the old NAPS thought, we have Dr. Rajiv Siriram. Dr. Siriram works, his, is focused on chronic disease, diabetes, and preventative medicine. He is a general practitioner attached to a diabetes recovery clinic. He achieved his MBBS at UE, and he has an MSc in clinical pulp, public health nutrition. Welcome, Dr. Joel Rampasad, and welcome, Dr. Rajiv Siriram. Good night, fellas. How are you feeling? How are you doing? Oh, very good. I look forward to this myself. <laughs> Siram, yeah, and we there? Dr. Siram. Yeah, uh, hi, we hi, having, good night. We were having some technical difficulties before, and we are trying to kink, work out the kinks right now. So probably if you pull me up there, Torian, and see what's going on, we'll wait for Rajiv to, to get a little more responsive. Um, we are hearing you, Rajiv. Um, I think we're yeah. getting some of your feed right now, just to making sure your feed is okay. All right, Joel's feed mm -hmm. is giving a little trouble as well. But once we can hear you, it is of utmost importance that we get this discussion started. Now we have a lot of people in the in the in the comments already hitting us for six already mm. with the questions and so on. <laughs> I know, I and there's a lot that. of different angles that we have to look at it from. We have to look at the science, look at the politics, look at the the rights issue. And also, we look at just the mere fact that how do we as human beings discuss and get to come to conclusions about this topic and topics like these. So to start us off, I want to pose a very um, pertinent question that would put to rest certain narratives I hear um, out there. And you'll hear the word narrative a lot tonight, eh? because I'm a literature man, right? So... Um, there are a lot of people who would say that how the virus and the pandemic is not as serious as the authorities make it out to be. They would say things along the lines of that it's not even should be called a pandemic. Some, some say, I mean, they might be in a minor, minority, but they do. But that comes from a certain amount of doubt with the facts being put forward and a certain amount of ambiguity and I would say uh, no confidence, a lack of confidence in certain authorities and so on. So we have with us here people who could speak with confidence being part of the medical fraternity. So let me ask Joel. Joel, you hearing us good there? I'm seeing you. I'm hearing you. Yeah. Okay. 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 Jo yeah. Joel, so tell us, in your opinion, is COVID-19 overblown in any way? Uh, no, I don't think it's overblown at all. I think the, um, the response to it, the international and national response to it, may not have been exactly correct at the time it was first uh, decided that it was a pandemic. And obviously, there's been a few missteps along the way, but I don't think it's overblown at all. I think it has been appropriately um, decided that it was a dangerous thing. I mean, if you look at, um, say, COVID-19's case fatality rate, it's now taken to be about 2%, whereas SARS and MERS and all the other respiratory diseases were significantly higher. I mean, 11, 20, 35%. However, COVID-19 had one significant difference. It was more transmissible. And the R0 calculations suggested that there were a lot of factors that just so happened to have been um, present in the COVID-19 virus. And I mean, someone could say, well, the case fatality of 2%, that's, that's very little. That's not really something significant. However, if it spreads among the entire Earth's population of 7 billion, you could argue, okay, so 2% is not much. But when you calculate 2% of 7 billion, I don't think anybody is willing to accept that number of dead or worse yet, mm. you know, significantly ill and long-term affected people. So, so it's, it's not overblown. I think it was appropriate. So you said something about highly transmissible, right? Um, so I want to add something to this in this question. And I would add, what would you say makes COVID-19 a deadly virus. Is it that deadly virus? So, and I, and I want you to just zero in on that that point you was making there a little bit. What do you say make it well, make it such a deadly virus? 
Well, it is deadly, but I mean, you have to also consider what you consider to be deadly. It's a case fatality rate. The number of people who die when they get infected by it is about 2%. So yes, it does cause death, but the, the real danger is that it will transmit amongst a large number of people. That makes it a great threat. Whereas, like I said, you know, MERS, the Middle East Respiratory right. Virus, that had a case fatality rate of 35%. But it only spread right. amongst a couple thousand people, so the number of people who died was much smaller. Um, right. COVID nineteen spread to the whole world. I hear you, M Mr. Siriram, Dr. Siriram. Good night. Um, we hear, you hear me well, right? Yeah, Dr. Yep. Siriram. Right. So, Dr. Siriram, in your opinion, um, how serious is the COVID nineteen situation worldwide? Um, given the you know, the information we have, the statistics we have overall, would you say it is as deadly as people would um, take the certain steps to mediate, you know, spread and all of that? Is it called for? So let me hear your thoughts on that. Uh, hold on. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, you know, I was one of the first physicians in Trinidad to try to raise an alarm that, um, you know, COVID was going to hit us and hit us very hard. And in April 2020, you can go online and you can see Rajiv Siram. I put an article out in the Express. You can check it right now. And I call for the government. Mm -hmm. to, uh, to develop a patient treatment protocol so that we can ameliorate um, impending fatalities that would be hit by COVID. Um, the case fatality rate was quite quite low, and we, we saw the strength. So you can see that um, many places, including Africa and initially South America, you could see that the DCFR was quite low. Um, the, but if you had to ask how, how much of an emergency it is, um, I think it's the earliest thing we've faced since the Spanish flu, except that the Spanish flu, we didn't have the kind of treatments that we have now. So persons could die of things just like dehydration and so on at that time. Of course, the CFR then was much higher and the debt toll exacted on the population was much, much higher. But um, this is without an um, emergency that, you know, the fine time that's going to change the, the, the world. The question is, is it an equal emergency in all populations? Mm -hmm. And is it an emergency? Is it, a, is it the same emergency across countries? And you could clearly see that there are some countries that appear to be unscathed. Um, I would say up until around April, Trinidad and Tobago is a COVID sanctuary country with a very, very low death rate. We, we never really had very good testing in Trinidad, so we never really knew, and we still don't actually know the total case numbers, the caseload in the community. I suspect the caseload might be around maybe four to five times higher than it's being reported. Um, in the African countries, the, the, case with Atiro, uh, the case with Atiro is very, very low. Uh, and those countries remain limited. Among children, it is absolutely not an emergency. It's never been an emergency. In the United States, there are about 500 deaths in children, even up to now with the Delta, Delta variant, and this is reported by the American Academy of Pediatrics. There are less than 500 deaths across the United States, and there are about 600,000 deaths in adults. So, so if you were to ask if where it is an emergency, it is most certainly an emergency in certain populations, and in adults, and I'd say in the gamma variant in Trinidad and Tobago, and in, the, in South America, it's an emergency in younger patients, which means it's an emergency in persons in their 30s as well. But in children, it's not. And in certain countries, it has not manifested with the same uh, fatality as in some other countries, like in the States and the UK okay. and so on. All right. So, okay. Granted. Understood. So, I would just want to put a little in something there when you said that how it's not a, um, an emergency among children but can we all agree that the, the, the factor of its transmissibility its communicable nature right does that factor in at all to 
the children and something like school and so on you think not not really not based on the data that we have published not based on peer review data if you look at the news you will see pictures of children mm -hmm. with uh, um, ventilators and so on and you hear music in the background mm -hmm. Okay. If you look at Indonesia, Indonesia is having a bad outbreak and there are a lot of deaths in Indonesia. A few months ago, there were deaths in babies in Brazil, about 1,300. Indonesia is about 2,000 deaths in children. Um, but what we're finding is that overall, in any country that has a functional um, healthcare system that is accessible to the population, um, regardless of Delta variant, even in the UK, the deaths still remain negligible. So, yeah, I mean, um, transmissibility, mm -hmm. the secondary attack rate in children, first of all, schools that have remained open have not been a significant. Um, once you use uh, mitigating measures, the schools have not been a significant uh, setting of transmission. And we don't have any good data to suggest okay. that the secondary attack rate between adults and children, sorry, between children and adults at that high, it's about 0.5 of a percent. If you look All at right. the secondary attack rate with adults, it's much higher. It's maybe 20% to 30%. So we don't have any good data to suggest that children are vectors of this disease. Well, we want to, we want to come back to that a little later in the program. So I just wanted to put a little pin in that. Okay, granted. Sure. Now, we talked about the fact that it's affecting um, adults. It's an adult emergency in a certain way, right? Now, there's this talk um, that has gone into all kinds of directions about early outpatient care, all right, and early outpatient treatment. So I want to start off with, um, with you again, Dr. Suryam, and we'll come to Joel after. Early outpatient, early outpatient treatments. Or maybe we just heard from, from you, Dr. Suryam, and I know you have a lot to say about this. So hear from, from Joel first. Joel, sure, sure. Early, outpatient, early outpatient treatment. Um, what is your thoughts on it? Um, well, most of the patients who do poorly after exposure to COVID-19, uh, as has been suggested before, are actually patients who have pre-morbid conditions. So uh, maintaining of a healthy lifestyle does have a role to play. Now, there's, there's other suggestion that you can actually pre-treat patients with various medications. Uh, is that the, the, um, the sort of... Uh, suggestion that you're asking me about um i think there are a couple of uh, drugs that are suggested early on there was hydrochloroquine hydroxychloroquine and then there was ivermectin recently that was suggested mm -hmm. as um, a, a pre-treatment protocol to reduce the transmission and perhaps reduce the um the mortality rate but i haven't yet found a reliable um review of papers to suggest that there was um, uh, a definitive answer to that. I mean, I've seen recently a Cochrane review, I think I read it maybe about a month ago, that suggested um, a, a meta-analysis of 14 studies, which said the conclusion was there was very low to low certainty of evidence, and that the evidence did not support the use for treatment. Um, now, obviously, that's just one of many papers that are to come out, and I'm sure there's other papers that might say the exact opposite, but I don't think as yet there's been any suggestion that um, any um, known medication can actually prevent or treat, at least not as well as vaccination. Early vaccination does um, offer a significant benefit um, especially for the patients with pre-morbid conditions such as hypertension, diabetes, um, perhaps some early pulmonary fibrosis or any sort of thing that makes your response to the attack from the virus or your body's response to the virus um, any less. So there's possibly something to be said for um, you know, having patients healthier. Um, as far as prevention, I think the only thing that's been demonstrated to have a, a known preventative effect is really vaccination and obviously the 40 days um, of, of separation which is the quaranta or the quarantine um, which was invented since the black death the 40 days the quaranta of separation 
Right. Uh, and that was shown to actually reduce disease transmission for sailors coming into Naples. Right. But, so stepping away from, from prevention that's, and keeping with treatment, do, do you think that there is any room for early outpatient treatment and that there could be some integration of it in any way? Um, I, I can't see anything that would treat a patient um, before they, they contract the virus um, in terms of medication. Uh, there hasn't been anything that has been shown to have a benefit, uh, like I said, other than vaccination. That's, that's preventative treatment. Mm -hmm. um, as, preven okay, as, as preventative treatment, okay. Preventative treatment. Mm -hmm. I hear you. Now, in terms of early outpatient treatment, Dr. Siriam, do, does it work? Yeah, absolutely. And um, this is the thing that this is what has been kept from the, the, the physicians in the hospital. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, you know, it's um, unless you have experience in that, you can't know. And we have depended on the WHO. We have depended on the WHO has already been found to be responding to studies which were fraudulent, as in the case with Sepan Desai and Surgisphere, which had to be retracted. So the WHO shut down its, its work on hydroxychloroquine. Um, in response to a fraudulent work by by um, Surges Fair Company, and they never retracted that because that was part of the um, the the, the um, what you call the solidarity trial. Ivermectin now uh, there is considerable data on ivermectin, and we have epidemiological data that is showing the trends and the effects of it. For example, if you look at India, you will see a disparity between the states that use ivermectin and those which do not. If you look at Goa, it, Uttar Pradesh and Delhi and several other Indian states that are using it as prophylaxis, you will see some very good results there versus some of the states that have not really been using it in, in, in any kind of effort like Kerala. We've also seen that many of the states in Africa, many of the countries in Africa, which, ha which are using early outpatient treatments, which are not completely dependent on our, on our Western evidence-based uh, uh, evidence basis for medicine and I can't comment on all of their hoops and so on but I can see that there is much more uptake of antimalarials and um, things like ivermectin so what we should probably do if we are interested in finding a meaningful solution to this is that we should be exploring other investigational medicinal products including vaccines vaccines are good too but we should be looking at other products that may be superior in terms of their side effect profile and in terms of the history of safety. So, as I said, we should probably contact the Nigerian government. We should probably contact some of the states in, in India and find out what they're, and even in South Africa, which has some experience with ivermectin. And we should be looking actively to groups like the FLCC and the Bird Group as well, and other, and other associations like the American Association of Physicians and Surgeons to find out what their protocols have been like. Also, we can probably talk to some of the experienced physicians in the community in Trinidad and Tobago to find out what their own experiences have been like. What we know, even if you don't go into these more esoteric kind of therapies or these more fringe therapies, I can tell you that if you can detect, if you can recruit your primary care physicians to detect patients when they're manifesting pulmonary complications and you get them on timely steroids, you can have an impact if you can get them on inhaled budesonide in a timely fashion. If you can get them to make sure that they take, if you can get, well, we don't, I don't know if we have proper access to monoclonal antibodies, or if we can even get access to the, um, to, to, to the IL-6 inhibitors. So if you can get timely treatment, because our strategy right now is basically to lock patients at home, to basically sequester them, and, or as you say, quarantine them, which has been used since Black Death, right? I don't know about the management of that. And to, to give them Panadol and tell them to wait. Many times they may be started on some antibiotics. But and the question is, if you are not interacting with these patients, if you're not seeing them, if you're not listening to them, and if you're not giving them very uh, careful and dynamic care, how do you increase, how do you reduce their chances of manifesting with severe pulmonary complications or otherwise that then lands them in the hospital? 
and this has been the crux of the western medical care it, it, that has been our that has been our really what has undermined us and has created a case fatality rate of two which is i i as far as i could see is totally unacceptable there are too many persons dying we have a thousand one hundred persons dying since april how is this acceptable by any means it means that what we are doing is failing and then we should be looking to countries that are having more success okay <laughs> dr joel anything to put yeah. in that in that um, um yeah i i i understand um all of what has been said but i mean assessing um research uh, as i'm sure all of you who've done research before assessing research has to go with how much you trust the research and how stringently you assess the information as given to you so it's it's one thing to say well you you interviewed 35 people about how they felt about something and it's another thing to review several dozen studies and determine from all of those studies the comparative key points the variables the confounding factors and determine if the evidence actually can be used as a predictive measure because this is what all uh, research is it's it, it's an attempt to predict the future based on past events so you're hoping that your past event has given you enough information to be able to predict a future event and therefore forestall it the cochrane review that i've read and that was dated i think like i've said uh, maybe about 3 or 4 weeks ago and that reviewed 14 studies totaling you know i think 1800 uh, patients and many of the papers did not cite their um their confounding factors appropriately did not screen for um alternative variables um quite a few of them would suggest that you know the uh, the the uh, ivermectin was not compared against other drugs but really was compared against placebo um and with the variability of the testing regimes it was it was assessed and concluded that there was no evidence one way or the other so it doesn't say that there's a problem with ivermectin nor did it say that ivermectin does not work it said that they could not conclude that it does work so it, it's a sort of a, a lack of a a conclusive proof that it would help um and then but the other thing we did conclude is that you know there are drugs that have side effects and some toxicity which may or may not be more than the side effects on toxicity of taking a vaccine um and the second thing is that um uh you know the the case fatality rate of covid-19 being 2% is is not something to scoff at is something that is is quite serious you have to consider that that is the case fatality rate that we have currently but um if the world had not um controlled the number of sick people the case fatality rate would have increased purely because the medical services of any country would have been overwhelmed eventually by the tide of sick people and then it would have gotten to a point where your mild to moderate disease would have become severe without the interventions and and it is correct i mean the, the general treatment for um covid-19 first off is quarantining the mild to moderate people who can manage at home but the more severe people need oxygen uh, support therapy sometimes they do use the isothiopril is as if romycin which has a mild anti-inflammatory effect or or claricid clarithromycin um plus the prednisolone plus you have to give them um you know anti clotting factors such as um uh you know clexane uh, plus you give you know pain relievers and you you encourage um encourage uh, lung mobility by making them do deep breathing exercises you really want to minimize the effect that the virus and the body's response to the virus has on you know obviously if you're carrying something along with you like maybe some asthma or maybe you know you have um uh you know diabetes or something that has an extra challenge to the body sometimes it it just goes badly for the individual um and then the other thing is giving someone strong steroids at home as i mean as as all diabetics and all doctors know giving somebody steroids will make your random blood sugar shoot through the roof 
So giving that at home and saying, go ahead and take high dose steroids for a week. You don't know what you've done to that person's blood sugar control. And for diabetics or mild diabetics, you've just um, given them a week of, you know, uh, 300 and something RBS. So it, it is a, it is a, delicate balance, you know, a fence sitting sort of procedure to manage COVID. But I mean, there are obviously improvements to be made in all aspects of management of any disease. And I, I do agree with Dr. Siram. There have been possibly some missteps along the way, and there's probably a lot of things that can be improved. But the current management as we have it um, is reasonably good. Uh, I'm sure there's lots more that can be investigated. There's lots more research that can come out. And I do think it's important to challenge what we are told by our leaders, because our leaders may not necessarily always have the correct answer. So I think a podcast like this is crucial to have the conversations brought up. Okay, thank Absolutely you so much. So, thank you so much, Dr. Joel. Let's see. So, yeah, so, um, so to both doctors, so before I hand back over to Dr. Siram, um, so this section, I mean, we have three more sections to cover, major sections for, for this discussion tonight, but just this matter of dealing with early outpatient care um, and really the risks, I think it really can't be underscored as to how important it is for people to be guided by their physicians, uh, because everyone's individual case is so unique. Um, the reason why I say that is uh, many personal experiences, but also of, uh, you see it illustrated in an article that recently came up in The Guardian, Sorry, I don't know if you could pull it up. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we just want to kind of um, get the wrap this whole conversation of early outpatient care um, for HCQ and ivermectin because from my understanding uh, is I am not aware of ivermectin being uh, a, an approved um, medication for human use. I know it to be in the U.S. approved for um, veterinary purposes. HCQ, yes, and apparently I understand. Uh, that India had a very large rollout, close, um, uh, I think it was close to 15 million um, uh, sets of um, HCQ uh, tablets that would have actually uh, been circulated. So it was a very different style of, of, of treating with the situation that, that they adopted. Uh, but we'll come a little, a little later on to, to, to the India case. Um, but yeah, we have a situation of uh, in Trinidad with 68 pregnant women contracting COVID-19 in one week. And why this is so important is that, um, you know, it, it really is dependent on the patient and their individual situation that I think requires careful deliberation and assessment from the certified medical practitioner in order to effectively and safely guide uh, this person uh, in terms of uh, treating with the COVID situation. Um, so perhaps I would come back here to Dr. Siram and just sort of glean his comments uh, on this matter. And, you know, early outpatient care, does, it, does, does those that normal standard process for early outpatient care change for like pregnant women and that kind of thing? Is, is there some assessment of the unique individual situation of the patient before guiding on certain, on, on certain um, treatments? Well, I'll have to say that much like the vaccines, there's very little data on treating patients, pregnant women with any of these um, agents. Uh, what I could say is that, um, I mean, there's gathering evidence just as much as they're trying to vaccinate pregnant women and, and, and you know, get, get some good data. Um, early outpatient care, first of all, 68 pregnant women, just remember before the Pfizer shot came in, right as that tranche was entering the country, all of a sudden you start to see cases of COVID-19 in kids. I don't know if you all noticed that. It's pretty apparent to the population now, and it's driving a kind of um, a, a, a kind of um, you know um, mistrust in a sense in the manner in which these things are being reported. 
because really your reporting of such cases depend on your depend on your testing if you are if you are vigorously testing for something you're going to find it as i mentioned the number of covid cases in this country is probably much much higher than we are seeing when we test patients privately the whole family is usually positive but it is up to the patient to test them to to test that to test the to take the private testing we could advise them to go and get tested uh, publicly but that's up to them so usually when you detect one case you have about four other cases there that are not detected and added to the numbers that's just the reality right and there's nothing that we can do about it we, we we're not a communist country the same is happening with with women with pregnant women if you decide you want to go and start testing pregnant women or testing kids you're going to find a bunch of cases right and this is what we're seeing here uh, anytime you have a lead up to a vaccine drive, you're going to see they've mashed the gas on testing. If you go to test a lot yeah. of people, one of us here in this room might be positive. Mm -hmm. That's how innocuous right. COVID is but, in the majority of people. Yeah. Yeah. The question but is, is, is whether or not Dr. Dr. Siram, yeah. yeah. Yeah, in terms of HCQ or ivermectin, is that safe for like pregnant women or something like that? HCQ, oh, we, they have never tested HCQ. First of all, the, the data for HCQ in COVID has stalled to some extent. Although we have seen good analysis and so on that has shown that it works. This, the, these drugs do not, um, they do not enjoy the backing of big pharma. For example, the vaccine. When we started use mass vaccinating the population with the AstraZeneca vaccine, we had the most skeletal data. In fact, we still have skeletal data in terms of published studies. When you look at the Pfizer study that they're using to mass vax the children, that involved 2,000 children with 1,131 kids being vaccinated. And based on that data alone, there were three cases that developed COVID in the vaccine group and 16 cases that developed COVID in the unvaccinated group, unvaccinated arm. And based on that data alone, which spanned about four months, they decided they're going to mass vaccinate. There's no Cochrane review there. There's no kind of review there. There's no meta-analysis. The, the data is skeletal with the vaccine. However, what you will find is a bunch of independent small studies on ivermectin and HCQ. However, what you will find is a lot of interference as well. So if you look at the Cochrane reviews, you will see one or two studies, big studies as well, that are overdosing patients, using the, using the, um, the therapies in the wrong time, um, using the wrong dose, using not using proper combinations. So what you have is a whole you have a whole mess of studies that are just muddying muddying the results. But in terms of the vaccine data, you will have one paper. You'll have one paper sponsored by Big Pharma that is taken up internationally and pushed by the WHO. Sponsored yeah. by billions and billions of dollars. And it and it is going to become part of and of course when you look at if you look at the COVAX facility and so on, you will see the kind of You'll see the kind of commitments that governments have to put in when they go to mass vaccine population. So you will see that the data on the vaccines are, are, are quite, quite shallow in terms of peer-reviewed published data at the time when the vaccines were rolled out in mass into the population. So in, in terms of HCQ in pregnant women, is HCQ safe in pregnant women? Well, absolutely, yes. It's been used for many decades in pregnant women. Is it safe for pregnant women with COVID? We have no idea. We have no idea at all. Right. right. So, so just, just, just your comment on before I, before I uh, just allow you to respond, and then we'll hand over to Dr. Joel uh, to to get his perspective um, on just, just dealing with your comment on um, the data uh, on on HCQ. I actually did find a journal in the New England Journal of uh, New England Journal of Medicine, um, and this is from Micha et al., and they actually made a determination that post-exposure therapy with HCQ did not prevent SARS infection or symptomatic COVID-19 in healthy persons exposed to PCR-positive uh, test, test patients. And this test was done in... Um, Spain, Catalonia, Spain, um, it covered 3,600 people, um, and it was basically the drug was 800 milligrams once, and then 400 milligrams 
uh, six days later. That's too um, high. I can that's too it. high. Okay, so, so, that's, quite, so that's why I mentioned, so I, I, if yeah. you could respond to that, yeah. Yeah, so when you do things like that, and I remember Oxford was doing a study as well, and they used, I think, 1.2 grams, and that was obscene. And they had the justification saying that they wanted to achieve a certain cellular concentration, and it was obscene. So what you have here is the literature peppered with all kinds of studies that are ill-constructed and then incorporated into meta-analysis that show adverse outcomes. If you're going to use a drug that high, are you not going to, in, in, a, in a level that high, are you not going to expect cardiac complications? And the question that I would pose to them is, how did they get that passed? How did that pass? If you're going to use polypharmacy in a, in a, in a patient who's having COVID complications and they may require antibiotics, which prolong QT interval and so forth, and if you're going to use it in patients who have already passed the therapeutic window, how does that pass a bioethics? And, the, and, and, and what we're saying is that there's a lot of malfeasance going out there. The problem is, is that HCQ cannot make any money for anybody. Right now, Pfizer is developing a drug that's similar to ivermectin, but of course it will be patented and it will be rather expensive. Remdesivir, which is a complete joke, was passed by the FDA and was incorporated everywhere. And they incorporated it the guidelines and remdesivir did nothing. And if you look at the data on remdesivir, Fauci came out after there was one study and he started to promote remdesivir. And remdesivir is a joke. It never worked. So what we have here is bad science. Bad science being promoted by the pharma industry funded billions. Remember when remdesivir came out, that made billions of dollars in their patent and it's complete trash. But what we have here is a cult of persons who are following, who are following so-called evidence-based medicine, but they do not question the integrity of the purveyors of that evidence-based medicine, neither the journals. Okay. So, so, well, so very, very strong. Is safe for humans in your mind. Very strong. Very strong. Sorry, I, I don't want to come up a bit strong. <laughs> I just want to have a look. No, 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 no. no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I sorry, think, sorry. Uh, well, I think, I'm, I think it's safe to I see, say. I see Swati here. Like, I just want Swati to put out, <laughs> I see Swati is putting out papers. I could comment on her papers. These are not peer-reviewed papers. If you were to take, if you were to just give something, let's say, for example, what's going on here with the VAERS system. Look in Trinidad and Tobago. Let's give an example here and we'll see bad medicine at play and why you must not take sites like, what is this? Health, you're taking, that's fine. This is a news clip from John Hopkins Medicine, a news, news site, but this is not a peer-reviewed study. What you're seeing here is that they are mass vaccinating the population and depending on persons to come out and then the physicians themselves have to report. But if you look at the, they have to report the, the adverse events. And the physicians now, it is incumbent on the physicians to carefully record those events, but that is not happening within the context of a clinical trial. A clinical trial has a very, very rigorous protocol. Every single person who dies, develops cancer, develops stroke, develops any heart problems in either group, whether it is the, 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 the treatment arm or the placebo group, must be, it must be recorded. And then at the end of that period of study, which is about two years, you do a statistical analysis to see what's the p-value, if there's any statistical difference in stroke, heart attacks, myocarditis, things like that, after about two years. And what we're seeing here is that you mass vaccine the population and you're saying, listen, we just use 200,000 persons. We just vaccinated 200,000 persons and we don't have enough adverse events. But here you can see clearly in Trinidad Tobago, we had several events. You even had a minister dying. And the question is, was that recorded as a death associated with COVID? Probably yeah. not. If you look at the COVAX facility, the COVAX agreement is suggesting that page, the government takes the liability for these things. So if the government is taking the liability for any kind of untoward effects, there's a possibility that many physicians uh, working under the government facilities are, dis, uh, are, 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 are requested not, or there's a, what I would say is that there is a culture of vaccine injury denial can set in, and this can easily set in. And this is why you cannot depend on any kind of study when they say news reports 200,000 persons vaccinated or whatever. You need to have clinical trials, carefully constructed clinical trials, and this is not happening. Sorry, I just needed to respond to that. Yes, yes, yes. I know I know. you want to get a little, a little touched by some of the comments, and I always tell you guys... Yeah. Oh, I just don't want disinformation okay. parading right. as proper science. All right, all right. <laughs> 
No, I want to move on. To, yeah. Okay, so we all understand that there is a big disparity in public thought when it comes to the vaccine. All right, there's no two ways about that. Because of the fact that the vaccine has now become something which is, is either you're with it or you're against it. And if you're against it, you are now, people say that they are victimized because they don't want to take it and they may have good reasons for not taking it and all, and all this kind of thing, which is understandable. Now, let's just focus on a fundamental question here, right? Because we could always get lost in all the different um, areas of the conversation and we could get into all the technicalities. Joel, can you just tell us how important, right, is vaccination in this in this fight against COVID-19? Succinctly, what can it, how important is vaccination to the fight against COVID-19? Well, there's, there's lots of reasons. One, vaccines reduces the severity of the disease that you will develop when the virus hits you. So it doesn't prevent you from catching the virus so much as reduces how it affects you. It will also prevent or reduce the ability for you to transmit the virus to someone else. Most importantly, the fewer people that, that spread the virus to another person is the fewer chances the virus has to mutate. Now, mutation is a natural thing that happens in all living organisms some parts of their reproductive capability changes at random. And if it's allowed to proliferate, then that mutation becomes a successful adaptation of the virus or the organism. Humans mutate as well. But humans' lifespan and mutation capability is one generation, which is about 30 years. But the viruses have the opportunity to mutate um, you know, every person it passes to. And if it has the opportunity to pass through two billion or four billion people, then the chance of mutant strains coming out and surviving and spreading and proliferating is greater. So if you want to prevent a delta or lambda or gamma or omega strain, we really have to control the spread. And so far, I mean, I, I grant you that perhaps not enough studies have been done as yet, but so far, that is the best proven chance of reducing the spread of the virus and reducing the effect of the virus on the human population so so yes so it's very there, important so i want i want you to repeat something just just to re-emphasize and reiterate because a lot of people they come with this this line and the line is and you could still get the vaccine if it if, it, if, if and you could still get covid when you take the vaccine so why yes. are we making people take the vaccine just get a, just go back over that well, and say it again and, and get into it a little more as to why would we make yeah. people take a vaccine that does that doesn't eradicate the chance of them well, spreading it I, I I explain it to my patients in 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 what I hope to be something that's easily relatable but you know I, I do I do recognize that perhaps it's simpl simplifying things a little bit too much but I liken the vaccine to effectively protective um, seat belts and airbags in a car. You could have a car that's driving, say, at 60 miles an hour. And if you get hit by a truck, that's it. You've had severe injury or death. If you're wearing a seat belt, it's not going to prevent you from getting injury and it may not prevent you from dying, but you have a chance. If you have extra things, such as a, a very good car or you have airbags, which may be ivermectin, which may be hydroxychloroquine, which may be quarantining, which may be, um, you know, prevention of mixing, which might be governmental restrictions on movement. There are lots of extra things that you can do. And that is, mm -hmm. I equate that to making sure that you have a more and more safe vehicle to travel in. But when you get hit by that truck at 60 miles an hour, don't you want as much protection as you can get? Now, obviously, that is very simplistic. But you know, sometimes my patients need to have a, yeah. an analogy that they can relate to. So I say as much protect, protection as you can manage. And I understand there's a lot of research to be done and it's not quite clear what can and cannot help you. I always say, if you can get the protection, take it. So you might say, I mean, there's this, this, um, this thing going around that some vaccines are better than others. And there is an argument that the older style of vaccine, you know, the original ones that were brought up by Edward Jenner with his cowpox thing, um, that original type of vaccine, the Sinopharm and, and um, you know, those similar type ones, 
um, yeah, okay, maybe they're not as effective, not as fancy and shiny as the more modern ones, the RNA type uh, vaccines, but wouldn't you rather an old worn out seatbelt in that crash than no seatbelt at all? Right. Don't you want to get some protection? Um, no, I, I appreciate I, I appreciate the analogy. I it. appreciate the analogy. You know, you have to break things in, break things down sometimes. Of course, it's an analogy. A lot of people might not agree with it. Um, it's simplest, but yeah. I, I I appreciate it. Um, Dr. Siri Ram, how important is vaccination to fighting COVID-19? So, so I always say the vaccine is like a Faustian bargain. Mm. The vaccine, yeah. The vaccine is giving you a little bit of protection for a little bit of time. And then what comes next, we don't know. Now, we have already, I've had a discussion with you in our previous meeting where we saw that many countries which started vaccinating did very, very bad. And principally those with a combination of Sinopharm and AstraZeneca. And what we could see here is that we have gone down that, we've gone down that rabbit hole. We've seen that, at that time I told people that look, we, we might be heading for a disaster if we follow the same path of Seychelles, if we follow the same path as Bahrain, if we went down the same path as um, places like, well, then afterwards, Vietnam, Mongolia, Taiwan, Thailand, all these places. And we ended up in the same place, which means that we continue to vaccinate with leaky vaccines, and every day we're seeing 10 deaths and 8 deaths and so on. Something is happening here. And I'm glad that we brought up the issue of, of mutants. Now, I wouldn't get into the details that I got into last time with what we found out in England, what happened with England. Um, I remember I told you last time in England, the, the chance of getting COVID actually increased after they started vaccinating. They found there was a two-week period where your community viral load increases, which means that it put the entire community at risk. But let's 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 get back to the idea of mutation. But but before we go into mutation, Dr. Siriram. Yeah. Is vaccination important to the fight against COVID nineteen? Let's get into that. Because if well, we go it, along to mutation and thing, it, it's I don't see how it how it how it addresses the fundamental question. And then you could get it into does, the mutation. Uh, it does because the question is the question is we need to see how many deaths we have in the country, depending on what mutants we are we are exposed to. Right. Remember, we had the Wuhan strain in this country. We had the Wuhan strain in this country. And I don't know. I don't know if the hospital is doing sequence testing, um, enough sequence testing. But right now we have the gamma variant, the gamma P1 or the Brazilian variant has taken over our country. And this happened after the vaccine drive started. I don't know if the doc, did you notice that? Did, do you all recognize that you're dealing with a different variant? Um, Dr. Joel, actually, yeah, I, I think I think the the country is actually focused on the Delta variant right now because again, the the other variants are bad, but the Delta variant and its subsequent Lambda offshoot is is why we were concerned about COVID nineteen to begin with the transmissibility, the R naught value, the ease of passing from one person to more than one other, which allows something to multiply. The Delta variant is more is more transmissible. Um, the Gamma variant is, I believe, has a higher case fatality rate. But again, there are, have been diseases before SARS COVID nineteen that has had a higher case fatality rate and did not spread as easily, did not get to as higher population, did not have the opportunity to mutate because it passed through so many million uh, humans. Um, so I think. Stopping so, the spread is far more important. So, Not, Dr. so, so the gamma variant is very dangerous. It's what is responsible for what is going on in Trinidad and Tobago, which is very bad. Let me underscore this is very bad. And it's what happened in Chile and Brazil, which is very bad. <laughs> yeah, but and I that... don't know. Right. I don't know how. I don't know how come. We have been, um, it seemed that we have been blinkered against what is going on because we are dealing with a different variant which is affecting younger people. So now you have persons in their 20s and their 30s having respiratory failure with COVID and that was not happening before. 
it's so not what, a Delta variant, which is why no, Dr. Joel is not. No, we have the Gamma variant. Let me make that very clear to the audience. We have the Brazilian variant in this country since April, but our audience, the government is not informing the population. The government is also not doing testing for it and they're not letting the information out. So they're only talking about Delta variant because Delta variant is part of the, the preamble to push pediatric vaccinations. It's all a political ploy. The okay, whole so thing is that the, the, the gamma variant is very dangerous and that is why we have so many persons dying. We put on 1,100 deaths within about 130 days in this country. Anybody realize that we facing something real bad in the Trinidad already? Forget so Delta. You're using the example <laughs> yeah, yeah. of Brazil, right? Definitely. The Brazil, Brazil didn't do lockdowns. They didn't do whatever. They have whatever strain, how many versions. They had a fairly high death rate. So, and they vaccinated. <laughs> and Chile vaccinated. Is Chile is one of the highest vaccinated. I, 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 Chile, I'm not sure. Chile has vaccinated okay, to seventy percent of its population. Right, but and they can't Brazil. control the government. Not, not Chile right now. What's the vaccination? I'm telling you about Chile. I'm telling you about Chile because I'm telling you that really the Chile is the trajectory we are on. The, the, so, Brazil, I think, is about what thirty percent or so. I can tell you exactly. Check sure. yeah. it up. Somebody pull it up. Pull it up. Pull it up. Pull it up. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, well. Before before we go there, uh, so, let, let, let me. The just question is: If vaccines work, out, we yes. don't know. All right. Brazil, right. no. Well, let's Brazil is sixty percent. All right. Let me let's see. Let's see. Let me hear you. So one of the things is that, and, and we spoke about this uh, in the last time you came on the show, Dr. Siriram, uh, where we looked at Seychelles, we looked at, you know, a few different places. And it, uh, in looking at that country profile, we were able to assess and almost respond to that question that Qatar is, is asking, you know, does the vaccines actually work? Because just by looking at the data, you were able to make a certain interpretation. Now, at that time, one of the ones, one of these countries that was a very interesting case scenario was that of Israel, all right? And Israel has continued to be an interesting scenario. So, Torian, I don't know if you could pull up the, 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 the article I just um, Israel, put in the chat there. Israel just uh, where, picked up 12,000 cases, at, which is higher so than... So let's, let's talk about the Israel... Let's talk about the Israel case, and, and we will pull up the graph with Dr. Siram, and, and if you could kind of just talk, talk, talk from the graph and, and explain the context of that in terms of, um, you know, the vaccines. Let's just wait for Torian to pull it up. and, and let, then we'll, let, uh, we'll, Let's, we'll, we'll, we'll let's think about mutation, right? We are in a sea of variants. They which, are not... Which mutation the, is, in, is in Israel? The same delta, but we, in the sea, we are in a sea of variants at all times, Right? We have hundreds of variants, maybe thousands of variants. Uh, right. But Sorry, there are some the, of them it, have... it, 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 Yeah, yeah. One second, one second. One second, one yeah. second. Yeah. Uh, I want us to no, try to no, understand this just, concept. But let me just yeah. say something, right? Yeah, yeah, we in a sea yeah. of variants. Uh, I and if I if I have my science right. correct, it's like you know, the every time the the scroll the virus multiplies, the, um, there's a chance of sure. mutation. Um then you have the the the, right. the, the Mutations to worry about, all right. But this thing is say about Delta and Gamma and thing. Now, I, as a layman on the street, I don't know. I know at all in terms of you know the nar the narrative and the the hype. The Delta is the talk. But I think it's safe to say that how I'm not too sure, and I could be corrected. And I know you just said something, but we focusing on Delta. But we do know at all since the Brazilian strain came into the country. That is when we start seeing the you know the hype, the 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 trouble, the trouble start. And we always wonder, you know, we had a kind of herd immunity going on. Well, you know, probably the, border, the borders were porous and all that. But um, I think that the Delta and the threat of the Delta and is, is something kind of like more look, looking towards that, that like breaks in and gears in up for it. Or do you think that they're trying to pass it off as we have it right now and that is what we are fighting? Or Because I don't really think that we, anybody we really knows. Them. The Delta is not, as far as I could see, the, uh, as I said, if you look at Brazil, they had 1,300 deaths in, in babies. That was a report, but they had more deaths in children. The Delta, is, the, sorry, the Gamma, sorry, the Gamma in Brazil and the Gamma in South America is as fatal to children as the Delta. We're facing it here as well. We've right. been facing it so, for months. So, so what did I, I feel as if the medical community, 
as not well, been in the woods. So let me let, so let me when you watch the the doc, we're right. really trying to say that oh, whether it's delta, or whether it's gamma, is deadly things. But look at the graph right now. We have the Israel graph here. Right. So, so, so 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 let me let me let me just talk specifically about um what one of our commenters, one of our top fans, Kyron Ramu is saying, where we are also in a sea of studies that is confusing many. And uh, both right. doctors, that's why I, I, I want to yeah. uh, really thank you all for coming on because that, I mean, uh, for me, I mean, I do a lot of post-grad studies, but with this COVID thing, there's just so many studies. So with just this yeah. case, I want, to, I want to hear perspectives from both uh, Dr. Siriram and Dr. Rampasar on the mm -hmm. interpretation of this graph. So this is the Israel situation. No, no, pull um, up the Israel uh, situation now. Shankara. Okay. This, this, pull is up a, the, this is a... No, this is a, no, no, pull up, pull up Israel right now. Israel is 12,000 yeah, cases. This, no, no. Type in Israel, go into Google and get the John Hopkins data. Go straight into Google. All right. All right. So just say John Hopkins ain't good. This is John Hopkins. Uh, uh, no, no. That. Type it. Go back into Google and get today's okay. data. Okay. Go into so Google and get today's walk, data. Yeah, yeah, walk. Yeah, yeah, walk. We 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 come back. We are come back. <laughs> no, we call it. We go. We go. Pull that up just pull now. Pull it so up, man. Why, sure why not? Pull it up. Let me ask you this. Let me ask Let me you this. So, today's data, the man. <laughs> so before we, before we get into that Israel, because we gain our data now, let me ask another broad question. I, so, talk, well, mm -hmm. I want to talk about a sea of variants, boy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we gain it, we gain it. Joel. Let me get there. Let me get there. Joel. Joel. <laughs> yeah, there, know. Joel. Yep, yep. You know, however people want to take it, how can it be explained? However you want to explain it, whatever stance you want to take on it, it's very, very broad a question. Do you think that we should view the vaccination process worldwide as experimental? Oh, God, no. No, no, it's not experimental. I mean, I, I, would, I would understand if someone thinks that they are experimenting in that some of the vaccine types, like the mRNA type, is relatively new. But, I mean, vaccination has been going on for 200 years, and everybody who's gone to school, at least in Trinidad and in most Western countries, have but been this vaccinated. this vaccination rollout, this vaccination rollout, yeah. the emergency this vaccination, vaccination rollout, this vaccination is it experimental? Rollout, no, of course not. It's not experimental. It, it is intended to have a response. It has gone through. I will. I will concede. It's gone through the um, the normal testing phase faster than it normally should go through. But then the alternative is to say, well, we'll go through the the, um, the vaccine testing phase the normal way. Leave it four, five, six years to see what sort of response we get, and in the meantime, people are dying. So it's not been pushed through for any reason other than let's see if we can actually reduce the spread of this thing as fast as possible. Now, most doctors, when they recognized that there was this worldwide pandemic, most doctors were hopeful that maybe within, you know, 18 months or two years, you'd get a viable vaccine. And admittedly, they came out with the vaccines within one year, which, I mean, having also med school, you know that that has not had the standard amount of testing time. But... The flip side of that argument is, do we go through the standardized thing and just watch people drop? So you have to put it through. So it did go through faster. And there may be things that turn up a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, that people will say, well, you know, had we waited longer, we would have known about these side effects and maybe we would have been able to advise people appropriately. But do you wait to see what happens knowing that if you delay, you're guaranteed you know what's going to happen. You're going to have 2 to 3% case fatality rate. Whereas if you do it now, you might have a 0.1% risk of, um, you know, various um, things that have been put out in myocarditis and blood clots in the legs from AstraZeneca. But what? when you really think about it, the risk of an adverse effect, effect from um, a rush through vaccine is much less than the risk of dangerous outcomes from catching the virus. So you have to balance it, and it is, it is a balance. I will admit that you are possibly pushing it through faster than normal, but it's not experimental. It is of necessity to save as many people as possible. So no, Talk I would not say it's experimental at all. Another succinct answer like that, succinct. <laughs> Before we come back to Israel. Before we go back to Israel. We're going back to Israel. I want to make friends. 
That's all, guys. That's all. That's all. That's all. Let me let me state it this way: the vaccines are literally investigational medicinal products. Literally, right? It's not that if they experimental. The answer is they are these designated investigational medicinal products. All of them, besides this, the Pfizer, which just got approval from FDA after six months or so, right? Why are they investigational medicinal products? The usual. Um, pathway, the usual development cycle for a vaccine, just develop in a stake over five years. We don't have time for that. We could develop a vaccine in six months. No problem. Safety testing, let me say we did develop it in six months. No problem, right? We already sequenced the virus and everything. We get the antigen, we can make a, a vaccine. Safety testing in animals is one year. There's no way around it. You must give it to the animal and see what happens in one year to see if the animal has any untoward events. You check them, you make the safety and not efficacy tested. You could find out if the vaccine making antibodies within a few days. You want to see if the animal is still alive within one year. See, then phase one human trials is one year minimum. Phase two human trials, one year minimum. Phase three, which establishes long-term safety and efficacy is two to three years, preferably three years. No problem. Should it be used as an emergency use um, uh, agent? Yes, of course. You have to try something. What you got to do? You got to try nothing at all. You got to right. try a vaccine. You got to try something, right? right? Right. But when you lie to the people and you tell them that it's not investigational, we have crossed the line. The medical fraternity has been disingenuous. Let me make that clear. They have not told the population that the vaccine is strictly speaking an investigational medicinal product which demands a voluntary informed consent process which has as part of that process a list of the risks and benefits to the patient as well as the indemnity or liability of the administering body. If you do not declare that and if you do not declare the nature, the level of evidence and data that you have, you are not being honest with the patient. The AstraZeneca vaccine has 3.4 months of safety data on it. The Pfizer vaccine that is being used in the children, go to the study, Frank Jr. et al. F-R-E-N-C-K Jr. et al. It has two months, uh, within two months, 42% of the, the, the children did not bother to follow up anymore. It stopped follow up after six months. We don't know how many persons will follow up after two months. We do not have long-term safety data. It involved 1,131 patients in the treatment arm. Well, let me tell you what's the most investigational part of it. More than likely, if a child gets it, nothing will happen to them in the first dose. Maybe something could happen in terms of myocarditis in the second dose, but it is rare. Let me be very clear. The third dose, I do not know. The fourth dose, just remember... Once you start giving these days, once you start using vaccines on the children, it is a lifetime subscription. Checkmate. You are in a checkmate situation with the vaccine industry. Let me tell you what's happening with this vaccine. Let me tell you the experimental part. The vaccine was supposed to go to 2023, but the manufacturers realized that the vaccines could not finish the trial. Because, let me finish this point. Because it it does not have intergenerational efficacy. We do not know if the vaccines will work between the generations of virus. So you're supposed to have it. You're supposed to see that the vaccine working for alpha, beta, delta, gamma. What they realize is that it cannot work. In Israel, you just had 12,000 new cases in Israel. It is a complete breakdown in Israel. This is the reality. So the vaccine and also the latest data in Israel is showing that in the breakthrough cases, the breakthrough is 13 times higher than persons who had developed natural immunity. This is the latest data I could show you here. Is rates of breakthrough. Right. I could give you the right. No, uh, what no, I'm saying is it is strictly yeah. investigational. Just now, sorry guys. Yeah. So no problem, no problem, no problem, Doctor. Yeah. And we know, we know, he had things to attend to. Otherwise, you know, you no, might no, think no, that right there, just get a drink. People, people <laughs> might, right? People, people might think that only <laughs> people might think this man don't have, don't have things going on. There be a real things going on, eh? You see this man here? <laughs> no, let me tell you something, right? <laughs> what what I want to know, Rajiv and Joel as well. Maybe Joel, you could you could just uh-huh. chime in on this. Yeah. What we what we have here is we have the pandemic rolling out into existence 
China and so on in, let's say, late 2019, wasn't it? Right? Late 2019. We are approaching late 2021 here. Okay? We saw Italy crumble um, hospital-wise in what month? So 2020. Um, early days. It was early days. It was like February, March, or February, yeah. right? February. Crum totally cr crumbled. You know, healthcare system collapsed. So are we, are we saying um, that given the the fact that we are living in a time where we have never been faced with such a challenge as our world, we have never seen first world countries healthcare system collapse like this. Are we saying that the the situation that we have found ourselves in as humans, where we usually are accustomed to gain an answer, you have a problem, it have an answer for that, it have a thing to sort out for that. We are now faced with a situation where we don't really have a proper answer. Do you think that, Dr. Joel, that it is that the, this this emergency is what caused the the drive for the um expediting the the vaccine? And if so, is it is it um unethical in any way, or is that because we are dealing with the fact that we need to do something and whatnot? Because what from what Dr. Rajiv is saying, talk about twenty twenty three and and one year of testing on, against the animals and then mm -hmm. humans and thing. The the and the absence safety of that. Testing. What are yes yeah, safe. Safety testing. In the absence of safety testing, Dr. Joel, what is your um, consensus well, on that? Well, I mean, he, he has a point. You, the normal procedure for testing of any medication, any drug, any vaccine is to go through certain stages and you leave enough time to see what happens. The problem is leaving enough time to see what happens has its own risk. And the risk of leaving it too long is that you have, well, you have nothing else. And you're just going to tell the entire population of the world, well, we're going to test this thing, you know, 20 ways to Sunday. And in the meantime, you just deal with the virus on your own. That was decided that, you know, it, we can't go down that road. We, we have to find something that works. We know that we haven't tested it, you know, in every well, possible way. But you have to well, offer something. Right. Now, let me ask you this, Doc. Let me ask you this. What are you seeing on the front lines? W weren't you recently in the front lines? Yeah, uh, at I was. I was in the front mm -hmm. lines. And um, uh, uh, point I have to say... Point 14, I believe. Yeah, now, I when, you talk, yeah, when you're looking at, at vaccination and, 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 and the, the repercussions for people who are vaccinated, unvaccinated, is any of the data in real time in front of you showing that the vaccine is helping? Yes, of course. I mean... You are still sometimes seeing patients who come in who have been vaccinated, who have Definitely. caught the virus in spite of being vaccinated. But like I like a, a tried to put forward a little earlier, the vaccine doesn't prevent you from getting the virus. But what it does do, and all the vaccines that have been done, reduces the chance of death to less than 1%, a fraction of 1%. Without the vaccine, you have a case fatality rate of two to three, sometimes more depending on the variant. So getting the vaccine reduces your chance of death massively. It also I'm, reduces your chance of getting sick massively. What, what, what I'm, seeing a lot of, I'm seeing a lot of, of reports that you know that when they look at um when they look at the vaccinated and the unvaccinated, when they look at people who have developed well, that's a whole thing with, with developed immunity when you actually get it. But there is a certain amount of information, Dr. Siri Ram, that points towards that people who are vaccinated, especially I, I think in, in Trinidad, they were saying that you are seeing less people who are vaccinated reaching to the point of the ICU, reaching to the point of hospitalization in terms of the in terms of the numbers and so on. Um Dr. Joel, is, is that safe to say that there is a demarked um, yes. number yes. of people? And the, majority, the majority of the patients I've seen who have been admitted to hospital for some sort of interventional treatment, either mild to moderate disease or severe disease in the ICU, the majority of them have not had any vaccination. I have encountered one or two who have had the vaccine and are still yet admitted to hospital for treatment. But invariably, those patients have had pre-morbid conditions. Diabetes okay. is a prime one. 
Um, some of them have had previous asthma or fibrosis of the lungs. Some have uh, ischemic heart disease. Um, but in large part, most of the patients who need intervention have not had the vaccine. Right. So I mean, that's just, that's, that's just, that's that's just my, your experience. And that's what and people that's are saying. my experience with a... Right. I mean, my sample and, size that I'm talking mm -hmm. about is a sample size so far of about 100 patients. Now, I haven't mm -hmm. researched, I haven't done the, the record, yeah. but I have encountered at least 100 patients who've been admitted for interventional medicine mm -hmm. of varying mm -hmm. levels. Most of it is supplementary oxygen. And of them, probably one or two had the vaccine. And the rest either didn't mm -hmm. want it or didn't get the opportunity to have it or did not yeah. take the opportunity. Yeah. That, and that's just that's just yeah, that, what what's going on there, Doctor Syria. Maybe something small to to rebut to that, and we can move on to the Israel situation quickly because we running low on time. We'll try to go to ten thirty today, so let's we have twenty more minutes. So let's just um that, get something on that. That's a reflection of the fact that uh, the majority of society is not vaccinated. If you look at the ICU data that came out today, uh, about three days ago, from July the seventeenth, what you will see first of all, one vaccine is vaccinated. Once you are engaged in the vaccination process, you are being vaccinated. You have you have subscribed to vaccination. There's this nonsense about fully vaccinated and two doses, but not two weeks after and all kinds of nonsense. Once you have engaged in the vaccine process in an in intention to treat principle, intention to treat principle means that those patients have engaged in vaccination. If you look at the ICU right now, I think it's about 34 cases. This is what came out recently. Out of 154 cases, 55 cases in ICU, 34 cases have received a vaccine. That means that 25% of the persons in ICU are within the vaccination process, which is exactly the ratio that we see out here. 25% of the, the population is vaccinated. It's exactly the same. The Pfizer, the, not the Pfizer, the AstraZeneca and Sinopharm vaccines are a failure. What we see here is a constant. I am seeing constantly breakthrough cases of persons who have been vaccinated, but you know what's the bad part about it? After having a breakthrough, the vaccine is the, 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 the virus is seeded through their families. So what you have is a breakthrough with somebody having a vaccine, having probably having some piecemeal um they're having good immunity against Wuhan strain, piecemeal immunity against the variant, which is the gamma variant, and then playing host as a vector with the gamma variant in, entering into their families. And that's what you're seeing, a seeding event. That's why we have so many deaths right now. That's okay, doctor. If, if, no, if you could, that, if, 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 uh, if, if, Joel. Let's Joel. Okay, let's say Joel. Let's say Joel. Let Doc talk. I, I, don't, I don't, um, I won't necessarily be able to agree with that, um, that opinion. In that, any amount of vaccination confers the same amount of protection. I mean, uh, there are uh, certain levels of antibodies that you have within your system and certain um, amounts of time that you have to allow for the um, B cells to actually you know, ramp up. Um, you, you can't say that one shot of the uh, vaccine uh, gives the same protection or the same capability to your immune system as two or as three. As information comes out, there may be need for booster doses and that's not unique to the um, so this current disease, COVID-19, that has been going on for decades. There are many diseases right. that require more than one shot. So this is not a new thing. Right. This is just one of those viruses that need two. Or, Let's see. as it's new, maybe or three, who knows? Mm -hmm. Could but be it's four. not Let's the see. first Could vaccine <laughs> that needs to be given twice. All right. Let's see. Let's see. Yeah. Now. Let's see. So, something. Let's see. So, there. So, 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 so two, 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 two things. Uh, the first thing, Doc, just for us who, who aren't in the medical field, I know it's just typical jargon that we'll use, uh, but if you could, uh, this would be Dr. Siram, if you could just explain the, the concept of recurrent infection, because it was something that I only really learned about yesterday, that, so, you know, it, it, it is a, a common thing. So if you could sort of explain that before we segue into the Israel idea. A breakthrough infection is being defined by the vaccine manufacturer, and they use the same definition in their studies, as a case that occurs two weeks after the second dose. However, if you use a... So if you had the second dose and you get the vaccine, so let's mm. have the first dose and you got the COVID, that's not a breakthrough. 
that is not considered a vaccine failure. That's where they get this beautiful figure of 95% because they excluded all of those. If you had the vir if you had two vaccine doses, two, and you got COVID one week after, they still don't consider that a vaccine failure. If you had two doses of the vaccine, and then two weeks after two weeks you had the COVID, it's considered a breakthrough case. However, if you use an intention to treat principle, right? Intention to treat means what's the real world effect of the vaccine process itself, meaning going to get vaccinated, what happens between the first and second dose, what is your exposure at the time of the event of the vaccination, you will see that there is a phenomenal amount of breakthrough cases, particularly with Sinopharm. Breakthrough meaning I am defining a breakthrough as somebody who gets COVID even after the first dose. And that is significant because that has an impact on the viral load in the community. That has an impact on how much virus, how many persons are walking around with the virus in the community. So the breakthrough infection is not just two weeks after the second dose. It's one day after the first dose. <clears throat> You see the okay. complications okay. of this? Uh, we can go deep into the papers yeah, if you want. No, that's it's a very complex issue. Yeah, so 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 uh propelling off of that, let's bring the conversation to the Israel situation. Uh which is now so 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 there are three parameters that I want to kind of clarify with this Israel situation, uh Doc. One so so we're gonna look at uh Torian, if you could put it up. Um so we're, we're going to look at the debts and how the debts really moved um, over the past. And, and, and as you quite rightly said, that, that article would have quoted, I think, since May or since June. So we're now going to pull up the data on Google as of today. All right? But as of today, real this time is what the thing. looking at. Real time, right? Mm. So this is new. And in this new cases, Dr. Sira, um, if you could give us a context in terms of does variants have a, have, have, have a uh, situation to play? What does the valleys mean? What does the tr what does the crest go, mean? Go to the, uh, go to the top uh, of the second of the second wave. Go to the top. The second wave is the post vaccination surge in Israel. That's what happened after the vaccine. Go to the top of the second wave, which is January the twelfth. Hold on, one second, one second, one second. I'm doing a few things here in the background. Right, Sorry, so guys. I'm a little. What are you saying? Don't worry. It's all our coffee. Yeah. coffee. You're drinking. It's all our coffee. It's all our coffee. I just <laughs> listen, Doc. I have to say it's an absolute pleasure chatting with you today. I'm sorry. I'm a little vociferous. January, come, come again. January, I'm a little vociferous. Go to go to January. Go to the highest peak in January. There. Go ahead. Go forward. Go forward. Go to eleven thousand. Right there. You go. You left. Go back a little bit. Go back a little bit. Go to the wave now. This is a fully vaccinated population, right? Go to the wave in August. Go Which, on. Um... Go to right. Go a little bit back. Right? Go back a little bit. You have eleven thousand one hundred and seventy seven. Go back a little bit. Ten thousand. Go back a little bit. Twelve thousand one hundred and thirteen. Go back a little bit and see if you get a higher one. 12,000. So yeah, 12, 000, 000, 000, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's supposed to happen. Not to that population no. that's fully vaccinated. So yeah, but isn't that, has isn't, failed. That, isn't that right? what Dr. Joel was talking about regarding, like, this is not the first time we've had vaccines where you need multiple doses. So is this just yeah, another one where we need multiple no, doses? What's the big deal? But the, the main, no, the main question is about, about I mutation. I think it's imitation. Yeah, I think it's imitation. I think it's the, question is, it's imitation. the question is, what occurs when you have a highly vaccinated population and you have massive transmission going on in the population, what does that do for mutation? And I'll tell you what the answer is, right? Imagine that there are thousands of mutants for COVID-19, but there are only a few VOCs. VOCs are, are variants of concern. Those are the bad ones then, the ones that are breaking through and killing you, right? Okay. The variants of concern actually are selected because they have the ability to evade the, the antibodies produced by the vaccine. They can, they can evade the antibodies, right? The, the vaccines we are using right now, which is the um, mRNA tech, which is investigational, and the um, AstraZeneca, which is vector viral, right? What they do... Sorry, I'm just hearing a bit of noise in the background. Sorry about yeah, that. Me yeah, me too. I'm not sure. Yeah. 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 The, yeah. The, vector, the, the new vaccines, what they do is they present to your immune system a spike, which is just the spike alone, right? 
they don't present the whole virus. So the immunity that you developed from the vaccines, the immunity that you develop based on the vaccine exposure is antibodies to that spike alone, right? It's what you call narrow spectrum immunity, narrow spectrum immunity. Because your, your body, your immune system has been presented just that spike protein alone that is generated by the mRNA tech. Now, what does that mean? It means that you have good immunity against any of the variants that contain a spike that is similar to the spike that you have been, um, you have been introduced to, which is that spike that is made by the mRNA vaccine that spike that is produced in the mRNA vaccine is based on the Wuhan strain. It's not based on the Delta variant mm. or anything else, right? So you are getting mm. immunity. You are getting immunity to viruses that are similar to the Wuhan strain, but you're not getting good immunity to other things. Now, when you when you mass vaccinate the population, imagine the imagine that is an ecosystem of viruses that are living together right some of them have different spikes and so on all of them are coronaviruses eh? all of them are covid but you take one vaccine that eliminates just one type of just just the just the viruses that have a spike similar to the spike that was produced by the mrna vaccine the mrna vaccine what that means is that you give a selective it means you eliminate most of the viruses in the population but you leave a few remaining that have the ability to evade the vaccine so what you have done, you have mm. created a selection. You have selected for viruses that have the property to evade the vaccine. And what that does is that you have created a variant of concern. Because now mm. that virus will now start to spread and dominate in the whole population. It's kind of like a garden. Let's just say you have a garden with flowering mm. plants and weeds and so on. You use a herbicide and you kill out all the flowering plants. And you leave one or two weeds remaining. The only problem is now, now that all of the other plants are dead, the weeds just start to take over. This is where you're going to have a rapid cycling. If you look at what's happening in Israel, you're going to have a rapid cycling of viruses. So you'll have a, you'll have a breakthrough, you'll have a massive breakthrough. So when you have natural immunity, which can be achieved by using early outpatient treatment protocols, allowing the patient to get the virus but get over quickly, right? What then you have is you have robust long-term immunity. And this is what the latest data in Israel is showing. That persons who had the virus, who had natural immunity because they had the virus before, their immunity is much more robust compared to persons who were just the, who were vaccinated. What, what you call vaccinees who, who were COVID-19 naive. So they didn't have COVID-19 before. So yeah, this well, is the crux. And this is why we yeah. needed to do full studies. This is why you needed to have studies on the, vi the vaccine across multiple generations of the virus. Otherwise, yeah, we could be creating a superbug. Yeah, well, I think it goes without saying that no. natural immunity is the best kind of immunity. The thing about natural immunity is to get natural immunity, you have to catch the COVID. And some people catch the COVID and, the and be normal. Sorry, Swati Maharaj is acting about this. No. Oh, okay. Okay. Doc, 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 doc. Don't think on the comments right now. So I, what I was saying is that uh, nothing on natural immunity is that I hope people know that uh, with natural immunity, the bigger gamble there is you have to get the COVID and see how you how you how you how you fend with it. Now, no, Doctor Joel, anything to put? Does not do that. That's okay. So natural about... immunity does not provide a higher level of antibodies than some of the vaccines. Furthermore, I mean, your, your argument that mRNA creates a super selection where you get rid of the flowering plants and leave the weeds. But then, you know, part of the argument that has been made is that the, the simpler types of vaccines, the original type, you know, the Edward Jenner cowpox style of vaccine, just the Sinopharm and Sinovac, the argument is that is not effective enough. But that does not do the mRNA type thing. That is the same type of vaccine that was used for the past 200 years. So, is it the simple type of vaccine that is undesirable or the advanced type of vaccine is undesirable? Or are you saying that no vaccine is usable and we have to go to ivermectin, which does not have any proven efficacy in multiple formats? So I am not what, saying what we're getting, no, what we're getting cuts, is an that... argument that perhaps <clears throat> nothing is usable. You have to let people face the virus and yeah, see how they turn out. Let's leave no. it alone. 
case fatality rate of two to three to four to six percent. And let's just see what happens. You know, just let nope. people float nope. in the wind. Doc, that you have, be I don't argument. think you have the experience with early outpatient treatments. Timely treatments make a difference. I'm sorry. What would you suggest? The, the battle, there's a therapeutic suggest? window. There's a therapeutic window before persons get into hospital. What we have what done in this suggest? country. I'm, I'm suggesting that we go, we can have this discussion in private if you like, and you can learn about these experiences. But what I'm saying, what I'm saying, what I'm saying is, is that our government, if you notice what happened in India, India has taken out a case against um, Dr. Swami, what is her name? Swami again from the WHO. Go ahead and look at what's happening in India. There's a dispar disparity between the death rates in the case yeah, but, in the, in but, the but country. Dr. Dr. What would you suggest? Are we, are we suggesting that... So, that they, that the the best thing to do is just load up with ivermectin and HQ and fire fire like like is and also what, what I'm saying is we are in a very dangerous situation here that the Ministry of Health mm -hmm. has asked that we snitch on each other. What we're saying here is that the mm -hmm. that the the Indian government has just taken the WHO to task for preventing them from using early outpatient treatments, which has what reduced, would you which has yeah, right. So What's what I'm saying here is that the what I'm saying here again is that the minister is that the that Parashram just came out and they are trying to squash any kind of early outpatient treatments by saying that we must snitch on doctors, we must snitch on each other and switch on pharmacists that are trying to treat and prevent people from getting into hospital. We have put we have told patients that if they break quarantine to get any help to get any kind of assistance, early outpatient treatments, they can be fined for breaking quarantine. We are in a, we are basically functionally in a, a sort of, um, uh, we, we are in a martial state. But this the, is a very dangerous situation. Right. I, I, I think other doc is asking a legit question. No, yes, but all, I can, what yes, I'm all these things are taking place. Understand what I'm saying. No, 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 but, no. Yes, sorry, I'm sorry. I, I just want to... Toran, yeah, take, take it away, Take it away. Yeah, I think as Doc is saying, yes, if this is, as you say, this is the case, we want to snitch, whatever, whatever, okay, that's fine. What is your alternative? You're not, you're not understanding what I'm saying. At, 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 at no, mass we level. understand. No, we no, understand. no, Dr. Syria. I do not I'm doubt, saying, guys, I do not I'm doubt sorry. that there has been the suppression of certain, of certain therapies yeah, and things because of, because of, because of, yes, I yes, don't doubt that. they are trying to hunt for physicians who are trying to help patients prevent yes. them from okay. getting we know, we know this we right. know this we okay. appreciate so what i'm trying true. to say I'm, is i'm not going to doubt that so so what i'm saying is if you go to talk about solutions in this country they are coming for you okay all right so, that, that, all right that's okay okay okay, okay. That, okay, that's okay. okay. What I'm what I'm that, you rather not say what okay. the solution okay. is for fear of repercussion next now, that, that is exactly what i was going to you can go on to and yeah go go have a look at what is happening in 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 india and compare to what is going on in israel and we can go ahead and we can look we can have a well, conversation afterwards I, I, and go through I the meta analysis i do have something about that about now that is your situation yeah that's that's that is your situation because yeah. Okay, you know what? Fine. They took the vaccine. They uh, the the case is going back up. No problem. However, Israel is averaging about 120 <laughs> had hospital admissions compared to January when it was up to 2,000. So I much rather the hospitals be empty and allow cases other people who need hospital for surgery for cancer for whatever it is to come in the hospital than be choked up with covid and have people die from multiple things so what what, what where is the cost benefit uh, as you say i think maybe this is what the doctor is saying the other doctor is saying like so you rather we just not test not 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 test sorry not do the vaccine and see what takes place not build natural immunity that way no no what i'm saying is let us what i'm saying is is that there are persons in the comments that are asking for solutions right there are many physicians in this country that have been very, very successfully treating many patients and preventing hospitalizations. I myself have treated 100 patients. Do you understand that? We have prevented hospitalizations and even in persons who, whose SPO2 have been dropping to 90 and we get them back. But what I'm so, saying is, is that we are in a very hostile situation here. And mm -hmm. if, we want, if we want to get into the details, mm -hmm. recently ivermectin, they have they have they have issued a warning so therefore ivermectin can no longer be used in this country 
However, if we want to get the experiences of physicians using ivermectin and other treatments like this, perhaps we can do that. But what right now, they have put a ban on ivermectin and they have said that they want to round up physicians for using outpatient treatments. So and this I, is what is happening. I believe that what you're raising there is um, very pertinent, doctor, because as much as we do not want to go down the route, I would say that just generally no one, I think, really wants to go down the road except probably um one or two people was i was i muted there no no you okay, good, okay. good. right um i see something come up on the screen i know we really don't want to go down the route well i don't think a majority i can't speak for everyone go down the route of saying okay to hell was with the vaccine we can only use our patient things but there's something to be said about the fact that there's suppression of certain things and it comes back to the fact that i mean i i, I see it as you know the powers that be, the authorities, they have a certain way of, of, of channeling. I mean, we have seen with the WHO from the beginning of the pandemic, there are certain things that they try to talk about in a certain way, and it's because it, it, it suits how they want to deal with it. So when it comes to vaccination, they don't want anything else coming to the equation because they want vaccinations to take place in order to see how widespread they can get people vaccinated and see how well it works and all of that. At the cost and at the expense, sorry, of, the, of not using early outpatient treatments, which may help. And I do not doubt that there are people who have been helped by your work, Dr. Dr. Um, Siram. But it brings up a very, very important point, which we want to end on and bring the last point up, because it's, it, it, it has to do with this whole thing about why where the, the, the rights to, 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 to use and the rights to choose. And, and, you know, right now we are hearing this talk about mandating the, the vaccine for the children. Although that has not been said as yet, it has been hinted in certain ways. People take it as a hint. People take it as a threat. The kind of language being used, we know at all we don't have the most tactful leaders when it comes to talking to the public, right? Now, we all know about the comment being that vaccinate your children or else. So the, what I want to bring now to the, the panel, um, and I'll ask Dr. Joel to, ask to, to start us off. Dr. Joel, do you think that it is um should government mandate minors to take the vaccines if it comes to that well, should there be a mandating of taking of vaccines for minors it's a very touchy subject i have to say i mean i understand there are strong opinions on both sides of the fence however i want to draw your attention to a couple of significant points that people can use to make their own minds up um, every child coming into school has to have mandatory vaccines before they can enter that's one um, every child coming to most government schools and some private schools have to wear a uniform to come to school. You don't have to wear the uniform, but if you want to come to school, you have to put on a uniform. You go into a business or you go into, so right now you go into any public space, you have to wash your hands, you have to put on alcohol gel. You don't have to do it, but once you go into that area, that is the requirement. Now, if the government says that this is the requirement for this human being to access this particular governmental facility and that is the requirement that is the requirement now i don't think they should make it mandatory but there is a reason for doing that so that those people who wish to attend said government institution can know that they are not having their own safety and security that they themselves choose for themselves affected by someone else's decision so I hear it's like smoking. If you go into a room and you say, well, no smoking allowed in here. And someone walks in and says, well, you can't stop me from smoking. You've just taken away the choice from those who don't want cigarette smoke in their breath, in their lungs. So you're saying, you can't force me to take out my cigarette. But the people who don't want cigarette smoke have now had your cigarette smoke on them. So those people who want to go to school and who want to have the vaccines and who want a certain level of protection that they see as protective to themselves. You've taken away their choice of protection. So I understand people are saying, you can't force me to, to vaccinate my child. But then similarly, you can't force the people who have decided to vaccinate their children to get exposed to somebody who is not. So two sides of the coin apply here. Those who choose to you. vaccinate don't want unvaccinated people around them. They say, well, I want my child safe. And those who say, well, I don't want my child vaccinated, they can say, you can't force me. But 
you can't force yourself on people who don't want it. And a lot of people want their children vaccinated. A lot of people want the protection that it offers. So if you choose not to send your child to school because the government says these are the rules for entering this government facility, then that's fine. I, I can understand no, people saying it should not be no, mandatory, but there are yeah. rules. Yeah, no, it isn't mandatory, is it? And, it? and I mean, they are just trying to see how much people they can get vaccinated. I don't know how, I don't know what's the data. I don't know how successful the drive has been. What we do have since the inception of these stay home measures is that you have online school. So when they say that how only vaccinated people can go to school, they have to put something in place to teach the children who are at home because there have been things put in place for that teaching. However, it's probably highly impractical that we will see that, you know, in every school, you're going to have online classes and in-person classes happening simultaneously. The actual ramifications and the rollout of this seems to be very, very detrimental. Well, um, you know, problematic. Um, but again, it is not that they are saying that people who are not vaccinated are not going to get an education because for the last two years, they have been getting an education. However, well, not two years, sorry, academic, last academic year. Um, mm. Now... The thing about it is the quality of education, which could be a whole other topic we could tackle on the next day, is that what is really happening with the education system while we are at home? Very, very, very um, touchy subject. Dr. Siriam, what's your take on this whole thing about mandatory vaccines? Uh, well, the, I think our government has thrown our children under the bus. Um, we've had a, a, a good period where we should have opened back our schools. Um, online education cannot um, take I agree. place of personal education. Absolutely not. The children need to get back out and socialize. There, there's a huge amount Definitely. of pressure for the children. Um, the vaccine, if you look at Israel again, the vaccine cannot stop transmission whatsoever. It has complete. It will fail in multiple generations of the virus. It will fail in, in, in stopping transmission. And of course, I told you that I'm worried about variants of concern emerging in those environments. What we could see then is that the impetus for vaccinating children you have to have an extremely strong case for vaccinating children. Right now, the fatality rate in children, there are less than 500 children who have died in, in the US right now. I think there are less than 100 in the UK, and the UK is one of the hardest hit countries in the world. There are about 10, 10 to 12,000 COVID-19 pediatric deaths internationally. If you compare that to pediatric pneumonia, it's about 800,000 deaths every single year. So there's a drop in the bucket. COVID-19 is not really a significant threat to the child's well-being. The, the, the secondary attack rate for children to adults is about 0.5, which is very low. Children are not considerable. They do not transmit the, the virus significantly. However, vaccination has, is not proving to be a, a, a good strategy for preventing transmission in children. Therefore, you cannot. There's no, I am not seeing any good reason to force vaccinated children or make it a prerequisite for re-entry yeah. into school. As you can it's, clearly yeah. see, Israel, please go back to the data. You yeah. will see there are 12,000 new cases. It is worse than the previous wave. The vaccination has not stopped transmission. It's it has not stopped transmission, but it has reduced hospitalization and therefore death. Not with children. Except with children, there is no such emergency with children. Therefore, okay, vaccinated with children. children, there yeah. is no... There is absolutely zero reason. And once again, once again... But you argued earlier that the gamma variant is worse for children. Now you're arguing that say, there is yeah. no problem with children. Still, which is it? And even though, and again, let me make it very clear, as bad as the gamma variant is for children, you can clearly see that there are hardly any... They have, I think there have been about three significant pediatric fatalities in Trinidad. As you can clearly see, even though the gamma variant is just as bad as the delta for children, based on what I've seen in Brazil, it's not really that much of a problem. And that's the point I was going to make. I'm glad that you brought it back up. So, so yeah. the point is, is that even, even with the presence of the gamma variant, which we are facing here, we have treated multiple children. Children, children, do, they get a very mild course and they get over. If you're looking at missing children, you just have to make sure you monitor the patient very closely. Even so, I think there are about 34 deaths in missing uh, around that. Sorry, don't quote me exactly on that in the United States. There are very few missy deaths in the United States as well. So what I'm saying is that you have to have, remember that the, the cardiac complications of COVID-19 in children are indeterminate. We do not have much safety data in children. We have about three, three we have about four months of data. Go to Frank et al. and you will see the actual peer reviewed a randomized control trial for safety data in children. It's not there. Any doctor, any member of the medical community that is satisfied with that kind of data they need to please, I'm asking them, please go
go back into the actual data and look at it. It's a joke. It's a joke. Okay. Right. So, so we don't, don't now, have enough safety but, but, data and children to make it mandatory. Yes, let's, let's, yeah, let's see. Right. There. Let's see. But, Go ahead. Yeah, but uh, um, so let me let, let me speak specifically to the case of teachers. All right, and I know Kota is a teacher here. Um, I agree with you in that the vaccines doesn't mean that the that that it inhibits transmission of the virus. But how could we legitimately ask teachers to go into a classroom full of potentially, and this is a worst case scenario, full of unvaccinated children? Um, where that risk of transmission is is still high. I mean, shouldn't their rights also be considered in a situation like that? Because it's a very it becomes then a very high risk job for them. No, it is not. It is not because I'm telling you that if the children were vaccinated or not, the transmission rate is the same. You have multiple variants over several generations of variants. The transmission rate is going to be exactly the same. What I'm trying to say is if the child... If no, but, the no, but the infection rates will different. be different. No, no but the infection the teacher, rates will be different. Let the teachers The infection rates for unvaccinated is much higher. No, it is not. The transmission rate... Once again, let me make it very clear. Go back to the Israel data. Yeah. Israel is a highly vaccinated yeah. country. The, the transmission right. rate is going to be exactly the same because the vaccine cannot keep up. You can go to this... Right. You can go to... Doc, go to Rela et al. Rela et al. Rates of say, SARS CoV 2 transmission and vaccine impact and the fate of so vaccine you, resistant strains. You cannot keep ahead of the right. curve. The vaccines will always be so lagging. The, so the trans right. So, so, so I understand that. So you say the transmission rates will remain the same. But if the infection rates are different, which from my reading, the infection rates are significantly different between unvaccinated and vaccinated. Is it that you're saying that that's not true? For the old, for the for old different, for, Yeah, but what we're saying here is that countries okay, that for are different highly mutations. vaccinated, a country that's highly vaccinated, right, what they have done, they have, they have basically reduced their viral diversity. So what you have here, you will have a rapid cycling of new variants in those communities, like what is happening in Israel. Look at what's happening in Jordan. Look at the other countries surrounding Israel. You would see that they are still flat right now, and they may have an outbreak eventually. What was but the... if, you look at, if you look at the death rate, it's not significantly that different. What was the so... vaccination rate in Israel? Right now, it's 85%. 85%. 85%. And what's the vaccination rate in like Canada? I don't think anybody know. Anybody could fill up some of them stats. I think something? Ontario is like right. 70%. But, but, but you see, you see why, why, why we're considering it in this case, Cutter, is because the classroom is almost functioning as a bubble in itself where teachers are being asked to go well, in it's this a very... control system. Well, let me be real. Let me be real. Almost to be considered within Let me be real. Yeah. Let me be real. See, a and school perhaps partner, can comment on it. Yes. A school yeah. is a different animal on the, the organism, which is mm -hmm. a school. You see, there's nothing like, there's always a different thing. And I want to tell you, when it comes down to everything, our government, again, the way they might communicate things, the way they might deliberate on things, the way they might jump to conclusions, well, decisions without, you know, people not sure what's going on sometimes. But there is clearly the onus that is on them to not have a clogged up falling apart medical system, right? Hospital system, right? Mm -hmm. And we know that how every nation took certain measures when it comes to schooling. As Torian would say, in and out, in and out, half and half, a blended learning, people in, people out, you have, to, you have to sign up to watch it for. They cannot take everybody in. A lot of people want to keep their children home, a lot of people can't keep the children home. A lot of people vaccinated. A lot of people not vaccinated. It, 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 it. People have to understand. Everybody has to understand just how complex. People, I think what's happening too is we have become so desensitized to this pandemic, people. We have become so desensitized. It's been happening mm -hmm. so long that people forget how we was thinking. Yeah. You remember how people was thinking about this thing when it now busts? How people was, you're afraid to touch anything out. Like, you're afraid to even come out your house. And if you're, I remember people saying, as soon as you go, put your clothes to wash one time. Like, you know what I mean? Now, like, like, it was a different <laughs> Now, you know, thing. we desensitize it because, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not all that. It's not all that. But at the same time, yeah. that, that emergency nature still exists. 
yeah. and a place like a school, you but still Qatar, don't know how how you're going to manage that when you go out back out yeah, of school. So we, but, we but, have to have some kind of system in place. Yeah, I mean, and the vaccination right, because I don't know. Yeah, it, you see, that, that, that's a specific it's scenario it's I, I want to discuss it's here. It's no, but before, let, let me frame the question simpler. Let me frame the question simpler. And let me hear the Joel if something it is on you have a t- Yes, right. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you have an, a, a vaccinated teacher coming to teach a physical class and the entire class, I would say 30, 35 students, are unvaccinated, isn't that a much riskier position that the teachers are in um, than any any other city? Is isn't that putting their their lives at risk uh, in terms of the COVID? And and probably we could start with Doctor Siram. And then here, I mean, Doctor uh, no, Doctor 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 first probably. Okay, right. Doctor Ampersad first. Yeah, I, I I agree with you, uh, and I think the the thing that we we all have to understand. And I'm sure we all have accepted this as well. But having a large proportion of our children at home, at especially in this sort of development stage in our life, is affecting how they're going to be as people in future. We should have not have had children home this long. In my opinion, something should have been done. A decision should have been made a long time ago to determine what we're going to do for school. So I think Landed. most of us are saying... Perhaps blended, but something has to happen, and there's a significant proportion of people who want their children physically in school, but the proportion of people who do not want their children in school have have had the upper hand, have had the say, have had the opportunity to say, we don't want this. So there will be a proportion of people who, if you stand on the highest soapbox and you shout the loudest, you get your voice heard. And there's a lot of people who are not saying anything, who actually want their children in school, who want their children to get the vaccine, and they're not being allowed to say their piece. Um, Teachers are being asked to to go along with something that they haven't had the chance to say because they they feel if they say, look, um, I don't want to be in a classroom where I could potentially catch it from one of these asymptomatic children. None of them know who has the COVID virus, maybe... 10 out of the 30 people in class might have had the COVID virus, and none of them show it, but I, though I'm vaccinated, I might have diabetes, I might have hypertension, I might have a little touch of ischemic heart disease, and I might catch it. And is that fair to tell someone, well, listen, you, you went into this to teach children, if you get sick, that's your problem. You can't do that. If they choose not to be exposed to that, they have a right to choose that. And if parents of children who choose to have their children vaccinated say, I don't want my vaccinated child to come up against an unvaccinated child. The risk is very low. But how many parents are going to say, you know what, I will take a low risk for my child. Most parents will say, I want zero risk for my child, not a low risk. Well, you know, it's a it's a low risk of dying for a child. So that's okay for my child. No, parents would say, no, I don't want any risk. And obviously, there's, there's, many opinions out there and there's no easy answer you know there is no easy button you can press that can fix this there's nothing that you can say well this country did it and let's just copy that playbook and put it into this country and it'll work there's no answer and and i mean i'll be the first to say that i'll be the first to say that there have been a lot of missteps for many people at many times, and there were a lot of things that should have been done differently, and I agree there's a lot of stuff that should be done differently from this point on. But to make it seem as though there's an easy answer, no. I don't Definitely. think there's an easy answer. I mean, from my point of view, I'll tell you something. I do a lot of training for people who do outdoor activities. I've stopped for 18 months. None of my participants have been able to go on a hike I've been able to get together and do physical mm-hmm. activities to, to go camping. All that has been completely squashed. So I myself would like the children to come out, but not for a selfish reason, but because it is part of their life. We've had our teenage lives. We've gone yeah. through those areas. They've lost a year and mm-hmm. a half. And mm-hmm. from the looks of it, if, if the one standing on the soapbox shouting to the high heavens get that put through, then they might lose another year. Heaven study, forbid. Study men do you be online uh, way <laughs> hmm. <laughs> hardcore. Hmm. 
That's that's mean. For that. That's mean. And you do it online. You even get to go and gas mm. shuttle around the place. Nothing. Not a shuttle. Anyhow, mm -hmm. um, Dr. Siriam, give us some closing sentiments there, no, man. And let's look the wrap up. Just some closing sentiments on this the whole thing. This, Just this to, not yeah, my, we, this, go easy on me. This is not mm -hmm. my own. This is such an important thing. Mm. Because we want to understand yes. something. You see, for my children, we already had COVID. There's under no circumstance my children will get this vaccine. Under none. I will never give my children an mRNA vaccine that has less than three months testing in children, knowing how many cases of myocarditis and pericarditis is coming out, plus not knowing what is going to happen down the line. I will never subscribe them to a series of vaccinations, which is one vaccine now, one six months, one six months again. I want people to wake up and realize what is happening here. And let me make it very clear. This is not my opinion. Children, the sec again, I'm saying it again. The secondary attack rate in children is 0.5 of a percent. In, in men multiple studies across, I don't want to get too technical again. Mm -hmm. Multiple studies across the United States has shown that there are, there are almost zero transmission in children to, to teachers. Mm -hmm. If the teacher wants to get vaccinated, no problem. And we're talking about unvaccinated kids here. What we have done here is we have taken away we have, we have basically victimized our children out of fear, and it is constant fear-mongering. There's, there's no but rational... It's a, fearful, no it's a fearful thing, though, Doc. It's a fearful thing. It is fearful, but what I'm mm -hmm. saying is for children, mm -hmm. for children, the, 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 the case fatality rate is very, very low. There are many other childhood diseases that are very mm -hmm. threatening to children. What I'm mm -hmm. saying is, is that once you detect the child fast enough, yeah. You also, you manage the child very carefully. Every single person with COVID must be managed very carefully in the outpatient setting, right? I hear you. What we're seeing is the transmission in children is not there. The data is not there, and the and the and the, it, it simply is not. The data is not there. This is not my opinion. The transmission mm -hmm. rate between children and teachers is not there. Let the let the teachers get vaccinated, and get back out. But if you go to deny children and say that they must take an investigational vaccine. Let me make it very clear. The COVID-19 vaccine, 12 to 15, is strictly investigational, and under that is, is investigational. And it will remain investigational for several generations. It does not matter if the FDA, the FDA wants to try to pass it. It is not, we have not been going through the correct, the correct uh, I hear you. Right? I, I so hear you, I hear you. Investigational. Several when generations it, need to pass, yeah. but anyway. Yes. When it comes to yeah, yes, brother, see um, we hear you loud and clear. Now, when it comes to the, the mandating of vaccines, it's a very touchy topic, people. Mm -hmm. Um, we haven't reached that point yet. Mm -hmm. We are still at a point where they are trying to mm -hmm. let's say coerce, they're trying to threaten, or just trying to persuade people to get their children vaccinated. <laughs> However, as I would always say, it is a personal choice. You have to assess your factors. We have had two very very informative speakers here tonight i want to thank them so much somebody mm -hmm. asked mr bola <laughs> mr bola asks when is part two we will have a part two and there will be developments and let's wait for those developments to take place and when those developments take place we go talk we'll about israel again <laughs> yeah we will talk about because well, me, by that time we might have to watch watch kazakhstan because you never know what will happen there. So, yeah. you know, we, gotta, we go, right? You can see what we're doing. We are not watching. We are not No, but, Sweden, yeah, but, no, but we def definitely, definitely what we see with, you know, the Delta recession in India and so on. We didn't even get to get into that. India and UK, we still have to talk about mm -hmm. those things. There are so yes, much the things. Session of the Delta and that we want to thank everybody for coming out. We need to All right? look at New Zealand. We have to be able, right? Uh, very well, Doctor Joe. Now we'll have to go. I have to go and check Doctor Joe and see what's going on with his with, with his tech home there because we wanted to see him moving and thing. But right now we have a static image, yeah. Doctor. We get the city man in, in motion, mm -hmm. but we'll fix that for the next time. Mm -hmm. All right. We had a mm -hmm. great great talk, and I would say you know it was a discussion. All the people will also all the time to call it a debate, but it was a discussion. One day I will host the debate, and I will get the people who you know and Doctor Siram will be ready for that at that point in time. Um, mm -hmm. and you know what we have to understand, friends, is that as humans, we have become accustomed, as I said, to having the solutions to everything. Mm -hmm. Anything, mm -hmm. any anything in your day go wrong, you know, who, who it have a way to fix it. And as only it, you think it's all coming down to links and money, but that will help this wrongs. Mm -hmm. All right, mm -hmm. 
Links and money mm. and helping nobody the strong people. We are going through something where it's very complicated. The solution is still on the horizon. And if we could discuss it more and hear each other out more, we'll come closer to a solution. And I thank everybody I for that. And on so. that note, yeah. and I tell you, thank you, Dr. Joel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dr. Joel. It was it Dr. was brilliant, Rajiv. guys. I think I think open discussion amongst people who have an idea of it is important. Whether or not you're on opposite sides of the, the thing, you know. Thank it's you, Dr. Sir, to you're talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, Doc, yeah. jo Joel, thank you so much. You're a real gentleman. Nice meeting you, man. I have to say, I, have to say I, I completely agree with your sentiments about the kids, and mm. I could see I you want them back out. Yeah, yeah, your heart is really in the right place. Thank you so <laughs> yeah. much, Doctor. And that's the yeah, thing, yeah, you know what? Nice <laughs> Shankara, Torian, we had some yes, issues, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but we'll, we'll sort it out. We'll All right? We will make it. <laughs> Everybody, thank, thank you so much know. for being here with us tonight. It's only love and blessings you want to share. Big yeah. up all yourself. Big Later. up. Later. And hi. Later. Blessings. Hi, guys. Friends still ain't good. Good one. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, yeah, let's give some love to the prayers, man. Eh? Yeah, okay. Hey, yeah. come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Joel. Easy, bro. Hey, let's talk when the next um, football comes through now. Hopefully.